They want you to come in that side. Uh, uh, Steven DeBrexton on Oxford.
Here's the thing about light that we can clearly see but can often be taken for granted. Light is unstoppably, impossibly bright. Sounds easy, right? But consider this. Consider the sun, this great burning star in the sky, too bright for the human eye to look at long. It sings a song with flames to sound it, causing the cosmos to dance around it. Or consider the moon, a lesser light, we say, yet at its call the oceans sway. Both night and day are commanded by light. Yet maybe the sun and moon are too great for us as people to try and relate. So instead, consider this. A candle lit in a darkened room, and boom, it breaks through. And there's nothing that the dark can do. No matter how it presses in, it simply cannot win. The light doesn't fight with punches and blows. It simply glows. It just lives. And from the moment that it's lit, the darkness simply must submit. And the craziest thing is this. The dark is dark, and the pitch is black. Only bright in the light that lives to push it back. You are a candle lit in a darkened room. So sing like the sun, call like the moon, and remember this when the dark persists. It's true when light is spoken, in the very place that feels most broken, the pitchest black, the darkest night, will give way to the brightest light. We are back in business. Welcome again. Welcome to this session of the 30th General Assembly Church of the Nazarene. Dr. Carlos Hamburg, Chair of the Board of General Superintendents, and our speaker this morning, is a remarkable servant of God. She grew up as a preacher's kid on the mission field and grew into a deep love for God's people all around the world. She became a missionary herself. Her appreciation of our many cultures, her ability to speak multiple languages, and her genuine enthusiasm for local expressions of Christianity combined to give her a truly global sensibility. Dr. Sandberg has gladly given over all of her many God-given talents to the spread of scriptural holiness. She is a preacher, a scholar, an administrator, and an encouragement to girls and women around the world who need a role model as they explore their own callings. I am grateful and honored to call Dr. Sundberg my colleague and my friend. After a short time of worship and prayer, Dr. Sundberg has an important message for all of us this morning, for the entire church all over the world. And I invite all of us to welcome her and uh, give our close attention to what we call quadrennial address. The address uh, reveals the state of our denomination. It reveals its health and suffering as well. It goes beyond the past and present because it offers a vision of the coming years for us to embrace as a denomination. Let's join together and ask our loving Lord his blessings upon this session. Running from house to house, 
cops were kicking in doors trying to find me. I was living on the streets. I grew up in the inner city. My mom had been to me when I was young, so it always just been me and my pops. My pops' relationship was hard. He was physically and mentally abusive. That did a lot to me. As a freshman in high school, I was skipping classes, smoking weed, and popping pills. I was just nowhere near God, and I didn't know anything about God. My friend kept inviting me to church and youth group, and I would always say no. I was walking on the plaza with some friends one night, up to no good. When Pastor Jenny pulled up, she asked if we wanted to get in and go get some ice cream. She seemed open and nice, so I decided to go. I was coming to youth group in Pastor Jenny's living room every now and then. Something felt different there. It was peaceful. I was finding my way with these new friends, but I still found myself getting in trouble. I felt like I was always ready for something to pop off. Me and my homeboys would never sleep, just wait for something to happen. Two days before New Year's Eve, I got shot up. I didn't want to live like that anymore. I said, I'm not going out for New Year's Eve with my friends. I'm going to go to Pastor Jenny's house. My friends thought I was crazy. I got saved that night, 1201 January 1st, 2020. I felt God calling me to more, to old me and the new creation. It was unreal, man. I was so locked into God, but it still wasn't easy. I found myself kicked out of my house and running around with the same friends on the streets. Cold and hunger had robbed people to make ends meet. The cops had been looking for me and I had two warrants out for my arrest. I got caught and I was taken to jail. I was facing a 10 to life sentence. Going to jail showed me there weren't that many people there for me. Pastor Jenny was there and had called my legal counsel to help with my case. While sitting in jail, I started to read the Bible and pray. I knew God was calling me out of this life into a new one. I wanted to tell people about him and how he had changed my heart and I was called into full-time ministry while sitting in my cell. After 27 days in jail, I was released on house arrest. Pastor Jenny had done so much to help get my charges dropped. I remember when we found out the charges were going to be dropped. I got off the phone with Pastor Jenny and started crying. I felt blessed to have all my charges cleared, to have a chance at a new life. Over the course of a year, my dad recommitted his life to the Lord and started coming to church. It has helped our relationship a lot. I served on a worship team and helped Pastor Jenny with the discipleship group on Mondays. I serve on the board and I am on staff at Total Life Church in the Nazarene. I'm also taking classes at the Nazarene Bible College to become a pastor. I know there are people looking for hope, just like me and even worse. I know there are others in my community, people that need to know there's more. Praise God for his transforming grace. Amen. His power and presence is here in this place. The king is in the room. Come see the scars of love upon his hands. The king is in the room. And we'll watch the darkness flee at his come. Who is this king? Who is this king? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. The light of the world. There's freedom in his name. He's awesome in power and reigning forever. Light of the there's freedom in his name. We believe this. The healers in the room. Let miracles break out across this The saviors in the room. There's no soul beyond the boundaries of. There's red. 
Psalm 116 is known as the Valentine Psalm because it's all about the heart. I love you, Lord, because you hath heard my voice and my supplications, because you have inclined your ear unto me. Therefore, I will call upon you as long as I live. Let's bow our heads together and call upon the Lord. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your gracious visitation upon our General Assembly. You have poured out your Holy Spirit upon your people in service after service. And we come to you yet again today asking for your rich anointing upon your servant and our dear sister, Dr. Carla Sundberg, as she brings the six-year report of the state of the church. Oh, Father, we pray that you would encourage our hearts with the victories of these days, 
that you would enlarge our hearts, that we would have a greater capacity for love unto you, for love for your church, for love for our neighbors. We pray, Lord, that you would capture our hearts with your mission and your vision that our lives would revolve around what you would accomplish in our world today. And Father, we pray that you would give us a singleness of heart that would rise above the clamor and the contentions of our world. That we as Nazarenes with one heart filled with your joy would be thrust from this place of assembly in order to do your work to accomplish your will on this earth as it is in heaven. And we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to have you practice that with me. Good morning. morning. Buenos Buenos dias. Bon dia. It is good to be in the house of the Lord together this morning. You saw a wonderful video just a few minutes ago about a young man named Marvin. I would like to just recognize that Marvin and his pastor, Jenny, are seated right over here this morning. Marvin, thank you for your life. As we gather this morning at this 30th General Assembly of the Church of the Nazarene, we take time in the midst of our organizational business to consider what God has done in and through the church in the last six years. The fact that it's been six years since the last General Assembly is in and of itself unusual. When we gathered in this space in 2017, we had no idea that we would be faced with a global pandemic with financial instability and social unrest that would rattle our world and the church. And while there were those predicting change within Christianity, we did not anticipate the acceleration of those changes brought on by factors far beyond our control. And yet, here we are, A group of people called Nazarene uniting to celebrate that in the midst of it all, Jesus is Lord. Amen. The founding of the Church of the Nazarene occurred between the bookends of the first and the second General Assemblies. The first was held in Chicago, Illinois the 10th through the 17th of October of 1907. The second was held in Pilot Point, Texas, the 8th through the 14th of October of 1908. We cannot overstate the social climate in which the denomination was birthed, a country that was still divided between the North and the South, bearing the ugly scars of a civil war, 
at Pilot Point in 1908, the resolution to merge a group from the American South with groups that previously united from the American East and the American West was adopted. The merger was a landmark event in American church history, since most major denominations were still divided by the American Civil War. Phineas F. Brzee, the first general superintendent of the Church of the Nazarene, called the Nazarene merger an answering of the Lord's prayer that they may be one. Now, 115 years later, the Church of the Nazarene ministers in 164 world areas and has sent, <laughs> praise the Lord, and has sent 1,008 delegates from 100 countries to this General Assembly. We come together in this season and time, united around the theme for this General Assembly, and we declare, Jesus is Lord. On behalf of my colleagues on the Board of General Superintendents, we call ourselves the BGS for short, I greet you in the name of our risen Lord, who brings light into our darkened world. We welcome to this, the 30th General Assembly of the Church of the Nazarene, our delegates, our distinguished guests, and Nazarenes from around the world who are watching online. May the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. We want to express our appreciation to the people of Indianapolis, Indiana, for the gracious hospitality that has been shown to us. Haven't the staff around this place just been wonderful? Can we give them a round of applause? We especially want to thank those from the Indianapolis District for hosting our General Assembly for the seventh time. Thank you, Indianapolis District. Our board also wants to thank our General Secretary, Gary Hartke, and his outstanding team for their extensive preparation for an event of this magnitude. We are very grateful, Gary, to you and your staff. And many of all of you have made great sacrifices to be here today. You represent a group many times larger than yourselves. We think of the multiplied thousands around the world who would be here if they could. The recent global pandemic has created challenges that many of us would have never imagined. To this day, embassies are backlogged, visas are difficult to obtain from certain parts of the world, and international travel is not what it used to be. We are grateful for those who have come to Indianapolis, but we recognize the great number who are joining us through electronic means as well. Knowing that there would be challenges with travel, the Board of General Superintendents devised an early caucus strategy for those delegates residing outside of the United States and Canada. Beginning in February of this year, these regional caucuses met via video conference, nominating general board members and providing the opportunity for every delegate to review General Assembly legislation. With the use of this technology, more delegates than ever have been able to bring their voice to the General Assembly. <clears throat> the Board of General Superintendents is extremely grateful to the General Secretary's office as well as each regional office that worked tirelessly to make these meetings possible. The 1908 Pilot Point General Assembly marked the dawn of the Church of the Nazarene. 
In like manner, we believe that this post-pandemic General Assembly marks a new era for the Church of the Nazarene. And while it is a new era, the DNA of Pilot Point is present here. We can only imagine that at Pilot Point, Dr. Brzee stood and addressed the crowd with his usual, good morning. Very good. <laughs> it did not matter the time of day, but Dr. Brzee would proclaim, good morning. For as he went on to explain, the sun never goes down in the morning. Thus, the sun of the Church of the Nazarene is just above the horizon. <laughs> Brzee saw the holiness message as being filled with such hope of transformation that it was as if the dawn was always on the horizon, breaking into the dark places of our world. Therefore, he greeted people both in the morning and at night with the phrase, Good morning! <laughs> Isaiah had prophesied that the Messiah would come with great light. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Later, when John the Baptist was born, his father Zechariah proclaimed, by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Brzee knew that it was always the hope of the morning, of the dawn of the light of the Messiah breaking into our dark world that would bring transformation. And this is our heritage. It is our DNA. It is the hope that the church had at Pilot Point, that they could unite around this transformational message even when the world was divided. That assembly in Pilot Point reflected what they valued, including the location in a small town in Texas and the ministries there. The property housed a publishing operation using the most modern technology of their day to spread the news of holiness. They had a college so that they could train new pastors and leaders in the holiness movement. There was a church that ministered in the neighborhood right alongside a rest cottage to support young women who found themselves pregnant out of wedlock. The church had a holistic ministry because those early Nazarenes believed they were to love God and love neighbor, and if they did so, the light of Christ would dawn. Good morning! The church in Pilot Point worked closely with the local Church of God in Christ, an African-American congregation. A year prior to joining the Church of the Nazarene, the Texas Holiness Association issued the following statement. With humiliation, we confess that we and our fathers of the white race of this country have not done near as much as we might have done toward the well-being and advancement of the colored race and are willing to take our part of the blame for the unneighborly and unbrotherly feeling which has sprung up and seems to be growing every day. They went on to say that they must take the initiative in correcting the wrong and effecting a reconciliation. And if we have the Spirit of Christ to accomplish this, we will be willing even to yield up some of our rights and preferences to suffer wrong rather than to do wrong. This is a part of our DNA, folks. It was a few years after the assembly at Pilot Point when the Church of God building burned down 
that one of the original buildings from Pilot Point was physically moved and given to the Church of God in Christ as a house of worship. Recently, that congregation moved out of the old building and into a new church facility. The wood from that building, the one that housed the holistic ministry of the Church of the Nazarene and represents the desire of the church to work together for racial unity and reconciliation has been reclaimed. The pulpit behind which I stand this morning was made from that reclaimed wood. This is our DNA, and it represents who we are as a people. We are a holiness people who love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we reach out in holy love to our brothers and sisters, ministering by preaching, teaching, and healing. It is the DNA of Pilot Point that compels us to continue searching the horizon, seeking the light of the dawn, for it is always morning in the Church of the Nazarene. Good morning! We come together at a unique time and place in history where over the past six years we have experienced much change. The global pandemic delayed this gathering and so many others. The joy at being reunited is palpable as we all hug one another. And we give God the praise for all that has been accomplished during this difficult season. Often, we take time to celebrate what God has done by looking at our statistics. Aren't we excited? As we all know, that has been a little bit of a challenge in the last few years. And yet, there are numbers that speak to the power of God to shine his light into the darkness of this world. You see, over the last six years, 635,310 people have given their lives to Christ through the work of the Church of the Nazarene. More than half a million have been baptized. During the pandemic, the 14 districts in Papua New Guinea reported a net increase of 5,743 new Nazarenes. The districts in Papua New Guinea with the largest gains included Papua New Guinea, Juwaka South, Papua New Guinea, Simbu, Papua New Guinea, North Coast, Papua New Guinea, Hagen, Papua New Guinea, South Coastal, and Papua New Guinea, Bromley Memorial. Can we say thank you to our brothers and sisters of Papua New Guinea? I believe that our members in Papua New Guinea are convinced that if they make Christ-like disciples, God will grow the church. Good morning! The total number of organized churches across the denomination has grown from 22,928 in 2017 to 23,670 in the last fiscal year. We understand that we are in a season of some churches closing while others are opening. Even with the pandemic, 3,493 new churches were organized over the last six years with over 5,500 new church plants. Total membership in the Church of the Nazarene grew in the last six years by more than 100,000. We have lost some members, but we have gained many with nearly 800,000 new Nazarenes. (laughs) 
Giving to the World Evangelism Fund, or WEF as we call it, has remained consistently strong throughout the last six years, ranging from 37.2 to $38.2 million a year. This WEF giving, combined with approved specials giving, has brought us to a range of $60.5 to $67.5 million a year. Last year, total giving for all purposes in the Church of the Nazarene remained nearly the same as it was in 2017. And while we rejoice in this, we also recognize that there are changes in giving practices that may impact the church in the years ahead. We have an aging church population in the United States and Canada, which has typically supported world evangelism by giving more than 90% of total WEF funds. When we calculate the impact of inflation, we have fewer dollars to invest in the mission of the church. Many of our global economies are struggling and their currencies have lost value. The church will need to address questions raised by our funding model in this next quadrennium. There's more good news though. During the pandemic, the number of our Jesus film teams did not shrink, but actually grew. Last year, for the first time, we had more than 1,000 Jesus film teams out sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. In the midst of the pandemic, we entered Luxembourg, our 164th world area. This was not planned, but was the work of the Lord. Our churches also learned how to use electronic media in a variety of forms to reach more people for Jesus Christ than we had ever imagined. One of our pastors in the Middle East had a service that reached over 100,000 people. Good morning! All of the ministries that follow are supported by and benefit greatly from your prayers and World Evangelism Fund giving. I'd like to speak to you a few moments about local church ministries. This past quadrennium, Nazarene Missions International, Nazarene Youth International, and Nazarene Discipleship International were organized into a general board committee called Local Church Ministries. Combined, these three ministries serve to resource the local church for greater effectiveness in ministry. Nazarene, Minis Nazarene Missions International, NMI. Can I just hear from the NMI delegates here a minute? Can you just give us a cheer? I know you've had a great convention and we're so glad you're in here with us this morning. The DNA of the church that was present at Pilot Point included a passion for missions. To this day, NMI, under the leadership of Lola Bricky, keeps us focused on our core value of being a missional people. Throughout this quadrennium, NMI has been the global missions advocate with the goal of reaching every local church in every region. Through the Global Week of Prayer, NMI has brought together the entire church to focus on missions. And with the release of the Nazarene Missions Project, NMI is working to nurture the spirit of missions and actively engage individuals to mobilize. New materials have been created and a clear pathway for new missionaries, both sponsored and global, has been defined. As a result, NMI is impacting people around the world. Nazarene Youth International, NYI. Do you have any delegates in here? Now those sounded like young voices right there. NYI leads the way 
in the nurturing of our young people and leading them into a relationship with Jesus, as well as establishing them as his disciples who are fully involved in his mission. This quadrennium brought a transition in leadership. Gary Hartke had led NYI for 20 years, and we are grateful for his leadership. David Gonzalez was elected to fill the position when Gary Hartke became our general secretary. <laughs> Throughout the quadrennium, NYI has been engaged in numerous ministries, calling our young people to a dynamic life in Christ. Youth conferences have been held both in the USA, Canada region, and South America. The third wave leadership conference was held in January of 2019 in Hyderabad, India, with 249 participants from all six regions. Following that conference, approximately 50 field, regional, and global NYI leaders participated in a two-day leadership conference known as the Field Youth Coordinators Conference. A total of 132 Timothy Awards were presented throughout the quadrennium to outstanding youth leaders who have invested their lives in our young people. Many youth discipleship resources have been developed over the last six years. The Journey event was an online gathering streamed on YouTube with over 60,000 participants. The Journey resources were produced in 12 languages and included a special edition of the book Way, Truth, and Life by David Busick, a youth and young adult ministry leader's guide with content for six weekly sessions, the journey travelogue, a six-week devotional, audio versions in English, Spanish, and Portuguese, the journey weekly videos. Our NYI membership globally currently stands at 400,294 young people who need the prayers and the support of the global Nazarene family. Let us commit to lifting them up in prayer. Good morning. Good morning. Nazarene Discipleship International, NDI. Do we have any delegates in the room? <laughs> Sunday School and Discipleship Ministries, SDMI, underwent a number of changes throughout the, con the quadrennium. We thank Woody Stevens for serving SDMI for more than 11 years. After his retirement, Scott Rainey was elected as the new leader. After two years of praying, listening, and planning, the Board of General Superintendents launched a global discipleship framework called A Journey of Grace in February of 2021. This new paradigm will likely guide our denomination's discipleship efforts for a generation. Following the release of the Nazarene Discipleship Framework, SDMI leaders around the world developed five core principles that drive discipleship in the local church. Using the core principles as a guide, an SDMI team from five countries crafted a new set of bylaws to guide the polity and actions of local churches with regard to discipleship. These bylaws were presented to and approved by the General Board in February of 2022. The new bylaws included a new name, Nazarene Discipleship International, NDI. The new name defines our disciple makers, those are Nazarenes, our primary goal, which is discipleship, and our boundaries, they are international. Global education and clergy development. Do we have global education leaders here? Would you give us a cheer? <laughs> I know you're here. <laughs> Global education and clergy development also underwent transition in the quadrennium. Dan Kopp retired, and Klaus Arnold was elected director in 2020. Our Nazarene schools play significant roles in forming Christ-like disciples. 
The church has invested in basic education and literacy since the early years of the Hope School for Girls in Calcutta, which was founded in 1905. Nazarene schools prepare people around the world for fully, fuller participation in social, economic, and religious life. The pandemic has created a challenge for our educational institutions. Some of our schools were closed for up to two years, and therefore we see some changes in the statistics. The total number of students dropped by 11.2% globally, and church support dropped by almost 3%. Despite the decrease, however, in 2022, we still have 51 institutions around the globe with 45,124 total students. The focus in this next quadrennium will be on a borderless approach to education, relying on regional collaboration and the strengthening of our relationships between our educational institutions, districts, and local churches. In the area of clergy development, all the numbers have risen, with total credentialed and licensed ministers growing by 14 points. While we rejoice in this news, the need for clergy is still very high on the growing regions, and especially in Africa. Good morning! Global Missions. Vern Ward has been serving as the Director of Global Missions since 2013, providing oversight to the six regions of the world. Three new regional directors were elected. Daniel Gomes in Africa, Stan Reeder in USA, Canada, and Jim Ritchie in Eurasia. <laughs> the missional enterprise of the church continues to grow and expand. Using our new framework for missions mobilization, we are pleased that today we have 325 global and 164 sponsored missionaries in the Church of the Nazarene. At this General Assembly, we are also launching Nazarene Missions Teams, which is a new name for what we've called work and witness for so many years, for 50 years, I believe. The new team's approach pulls the various types of mission activities together under one umbrella, providing a greater range of opportunities for people to participate in short-term missions, including sports, evangelism, compassion, Jesus Film, medical missions, technology, emergency response, and education, as well as construction. Jesus Film. Jesus Film Harvest Partners, led by Brian Hellstrom, currently empowers 1,109 teams of local people doing evangelism, discipleship, and church planting in some of the most difficult places on the planet. Every 22 minutes, there is another showing of the Jesus film. Every 43 seconds, one more person makes a decision for Christ. And in the last six years through Jesus film, 3.5 million people have made decisions for Christ. And 55,000 preaching points were planted to disciple these new believers. We are grateful for the 25 years of impact this ministry has had on the growth of the Global Church of the Nazarene. Good morning. Nazarene Compassionate Ministries. Nazarene Compassionate Ministries is under the leadership of Nell Becker Sweden, and she has helped us respond to those who are suffering in the midst of crises. During the COVID pandemic, the church mobilized to respond to urgent needs. We were able to serve 426,992 people through 192 Nazarene projects. We responded with specific programs in 88 countries through 393 of our districts. 
Almost 6,000 churches jumped into action, ready to serve their communities, and we immediately released nearly $1.7 million through Compassionate Ministries to respond to the needs of COVID. An estimated 100 million people are currently living displaced from their homes by war, famine, climate, and persecution. We responded, church. 500 plus volunteers mobilized to support refugees and immigrants in Honduras, Mexico, and Ukraine. From the day the war in Ukraine started in February of 2022, local Nazarene churches have been responding. The Nazarene Network made it possible to mobilize volunteers and staff to begin welcoming refugees in Hungary, Moldova, Poland, and Romania. In Ukraine itself, our pastors and lay people have not stopped providing food and comfort to those who have stayed in the face of great danger. In Poland, a constant stream of volunteers has welcomed those crossing the border between the two countries, helping direct people to resources that will help them find food, shelter, and support for the next steps, as well as carrying huge bags of luggage up and down stairs to help people enter into a new country as refugees. The Sweet Surrender Coffee Shop in Poznan has provided a place of consistency, hope, and love to those who were forced to flee. Their children can participate in educational and support activities. Volunteers can rest, and the peace of Christ absolutely abounds. 2,000 migrants from Haiti, Cuba, and Venezuela receive food, biosafety kits, diapers, and clothes for children and supplies from a ministry in Honduras. Over 30,000 migrants in Mexico receive food, shelter, hygiene kits, and more from our ministries across Mexico. Responding to the needs of children and focusing on our children, we currently have 236 child development centers in 36 countries. Those child development centers are actively providing, (laughs) thanks be to God, isn't it? these children. We give them spiritual, nutritional, educational, and emotional support. Currently, over 11,000 children living in vulnerable environments, including more than 3,000 pastors' children, have been sponsored or are being supported through Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, giving them a chance to grow into the people that God created them to be. Good morning, church! We have had transitions, and we note with sadness the passing of four former general superintendents. Stan Toller went to be with the Lord in 2017. Having served as a general superintendent from 2009 to 2013, he was a pastor for many years, in addition to being a beloved speaker and writer who poured himself into the training of future leaders in the church. He was just 67. Jean Stowe died in 2020, having given 25 years to the general superintendency from 1968 to 1993. He was known for his great love for people, his investment in our youth, and his compelling preaching. Dr. Stowe died at the age of 98. His beloved wife, Faye, died in 2017 at the age of 99. Gerald Johnson, my dad, a leader in the movement to truly internationalize the church and raise up national and regional leaders, served the denomination as a general superintendent from 1980 to 1997. Dr. Johnson died in 2020, age 92, and his darling Alice died in 2019 at the age of 95. And I miss my dad and mom. (laughs) Paul Cunningham was widely known for his radical optimism. 
based on his understanding of our God as one capable of immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. He was a general superintendent from 1993 to 2009 and was welcomed into heaven at 22, in 2020 at the age of 82. Janelle Johnson, faithful and supportive wife to Talmadge Johnson, died in 2021. She was 85. Her husband was a general superintendent from 2001 to 2005. Judy Greathouse, the wife of William Greathouse, died in 2022 at age 84. William was a general superintendent from 1976 to 1989 before he married Judy in his retirement. The pandemic also had a significant impact on some of our districts around the world, which suffered great loss. In Peru alone, over 400 people passed away from COVID. We lost church leaders in Mexico and Guatemala, as well as among the Native Americans in the United States. We also had a tragic plane crash that took the lives of a number of our pastors and leaders in Cuba. We also lost Dr. Dan Kopp, the Director of Global Education and Clergy Development, who served the global church for 15 years. Let's just take a moment right now, because it's been a long six years, to pause and remember those whom we have lost and pray for their families in their time of grief. In order to keep the denomination focused on our mission to make Christ-like disciples in the nations, throughout this past quadrennium, the BGS unpacked the mission statement through several key emphases. Our first emphasis was on the missional enterprise of the church going into all the nations. We had a need to reevaluate our missions program and the ways in which we called deployed and supported our missionaries. The new Nazarene Missions Project answered the most essential questions raised by the various constituencies. There is now a clear definition of a Nazarene missionary and just two missionary categories, either global or sponsored. Global missionaries are career missionaries who are funded by WEF and are using previous ministry or specialty service experience wherever the church needs them. Sponsored missionaries are short-term missionaries, serving no more than four years, funded by their local communities, serving localized needs on the field, and needing no previous ministry experience. This year, we commissioned 11 new global missionaries from the Dominican Republic, Mexico, Portugal, Venezuela, Brazil, Fiji, Jordan, and Switzerland. Over the quadrennium, <laughs> yes. Over the quadrennium, we commissioned a total of 98 new missionaries. <laughs> Nazarene Missions is a movement of God through the people of God. Good morning. The second emphasis of the quadrennium has already been mentioned. Since we are called to make Christ-like disciples, it was time to reevaluate re what we have been doing and how we might reshape discipleship for this new century of the church. This became the Nazarene Discipleship Project, and God gave us the journey of grace as a framework for this discipleship. The framework can be used across the generations to help people respond to prevenient grace, enter into saving grace, and experience sanctifying grace. We are leaning into our calling to make Christ-like disciples, and this includes all generations. 
It is not our intention to say that we are finished with one project and now there's another or new emphasis. Instead, we believe that we are building these emphases so that they will be continuous and ongoing in the life of the church. We as the Board of General Superintendents are now beginning a process of examining our Nazarene identity. We engage in missions and discipleship because Christ compels us, and this is our Nazarene identity. In a world filled with generic Christianity, we believe that it is important to know who we are and why we exist. And you will be hearing more about this in the coming quadrennium. In response to referrals that we received from the last General Assembly, as we look towards the future, the Board of General Superintendents is making several recommendations to this General Assembly. Articles of Faith. The 2017 General Assembly voted that the Board of General Superintendents appoint a group to study several sections of the Articles of Faith over the quadrennium. Composed of some of our finest theologians and pastors, the study group met on several occasions to review the articles thoroughly and recommend revisions. We have received their work, and after careful examination, we believe that the revisions strengthen the articles, and we are recommending them to the General Assembly for adoption. The Covenant of Christian Conduct. Portions of the Covenant of Christian Conduct were refer referred to the Board of General Superintendents for review. As a result, the BGS appointed a global group of Nazarene theologians, eth ethicists, pastors, psychologists, and others to study our manual statements regarding paragraph 28, the Christian life, as well as topics related to the sanctity of human life and gender identity. This group was able to meet face-to-face -face on a couple of occasions before the pandemic and then continued their work by video conference and email. This group has embraced a holistic view of the Christian life that helps to guide us on the journey of grace. After prayerful and careful examination, we are also recommending their resolutions for adoption. Now, what we've learned. Throughout these last six years, we have learned that the church is resilient. Theodore Beza once said, it belongs to the church of God to receive blows rather than to inflict them. But she is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. God has remained faithful to the church through the work of Jesus Christ. And it is in this centering core, the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that we find our strength. That's why it's always morning in the Church of the Nazarene. Good morning. Good morning. So I want us to return to that DNA of Pilot Point, where we jointly recognize the sovereignty of Christ, and we merged to become the Church of the Nazarene, a holiness church. The Lordship of Jesus Christ remains the foundation of our understanding of holiness. We are all, every one of us, on a journey of grace, traveling from prevenient to saving to sanctifying grace. The trajectory leads us to the holiness of Christ, and it should be reflected in and through our lives. Along the way, we ought to be making diligent inquiry. We need to make space for the questions that people are asking. But I would venture that as we ask questions, we will find ourselves on well-worn paths. Dr. Brzee famously preached, anything new in religion is false, and yet everything in salvation is marvelously new to him who finds it. The Reformers of the church did not lead people onto a new path, but back to old truths. It is in the space of old truth that we find the first century church, refusing to capitulate to the power of culture and firmly declaring, Jesus is Lord. Amen. 
for those Christians in the first century to become a Christian meant radical conversion to a new way of life, turning from the direction of the empire where Caesar was Lord. This new way of life was seen as being out of sync with society, and it included a dedication to being formed spiritually and shaped by a robust prayer life, the study of scripture, and personal practices of self-denial. We Nazarenes call this discipleship, but not just a once or twice a month attend a worship service kind of discipleship but rather a wake-up call to a lifestyle of Christ-centered discipleship that does not mirror this world. Not surprisingly, this way of life is evangelistic as believers become a living testament to the transformational work of Christ just like Marvin. Good morning! A life of Christian discipleship is one committed to the holy life. Phineas Brzee famously proclaimed that the message of holiness was to Christianize Christianity. It seems that the more familiar we become with our religion, the greater the temptation to lose the connection to Christ himself. Early Christianity saw no distinction between being a Christian and being a holy Christian. It was understood that Christ had come to transform humanity into his image, which is holy. The holiness movement, led by Wesley and others, did well to reclaim this early emphasis on holiness. But folks we may be on the verge of losing our grasp with it once again. In April of 1995, Keith Drury from the Wesleyan Church presented a paper at a breakfast meeting of the Christian Holiness Partnership. It was entitled, The Holiness Movement is Dead. In his paper, he argued eight reasons for the demise of the holiness movement. Number one, we wanted to be respectable. Number two, we have plunged into the evangelical mainstream. Number three, we failed to convince the younger generation. Fourth, we quit making holiness the main issue. Number five, we lost the lay people. Six, we overreacted against the abuses of the past. Seven, we adopted church growth thinking without theological thinking. Eight, we didn't notice the battle line moved. Drury explained his final point. He said this, many of our people do not need to be sanctified. They need to be saved. The doctrine at risk in many holiness churches is not entire sanctification, but transformational conversion. And only transformational conversion will lead us into entire sanctification and Christ-likeness. Our mission statement to make Christ-like disciples in the nations means that holiness remains at the core of our denominational identity. Good morning! Discipleship has always placed an emphasis upon continuous and ongoing life within the life of the believer. We remain on this journey of grace throughout our entire lives. Without recognizing this vital need, our entire movement will become stagnant and everything will grind to a halt, including the invitation to join the journey or for us to be engaged in evangelism. We have been taught by the faithful who've gone before that by reflecting the life of Christ, the church, even when battered, can reflect the holy love found in the triune God. The result is transformation into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Good morning! 
If Jesus is Lord and if Jesus is holy, then the call to God's people is to be holy. Holiness must remain our main issue. When Christ dawns into our darkened world, we will experience transformational power. And this is the beauty of what we find in the Church of the Nazarene. But this transformation is not just for the individual. Holy Spirit power transforms us and unites us as a people. And our core values express this unity. Our first one? I don't know. Do you know it? Can you say it with me? We are a Christian people. As members of the church... Uni- just a second. That was kind of weak. Let's just try it one more time, all right? We are a... Well done. As members of the Church Universal, we join with all true believers in proclaiming the Lordship of Jesus Christ and in affirming the historic Trinitarian creeds and beliefs of the Christian faith. Our second core value, let's see if you can get it, we are a... Oh, Oh, that was really good. All right. God, who is holy calls us to a life of holiness. We believe that the Holy Spirit seeks to do in us a second work of grace, called by various terms, including entire sanctification and baptism with the Holy Spirit, cleansing us from all sin, renewing us in the image of God, empowering us to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbors as ourselves and producing in us the character of Christ. Holiness in the life of believers is most clearly understood as Christ-likeness. Our third core value, we are a... Very good. We are a sent people responding to the call of Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit to go into all the world, witnessing to the Lordship of Christ and participating with God in the building of the church and the extension of his kingdom. I hope you heard here, however, that it's not just that we are Christian holiness missional. The point is we are a Christian people a holiness people, a missional people. You see, if we do not live out holiness within the community, both in the church and in society at large, we will fail to be engaged in our mission. Since Christ is our example, we are called to embrace his preaching, his teaching, and his healing ministries as our model. And this is the DNA that we have received from Pilot Point. Good morning. Now, many of the social issues we face, they need to be addressed. And they need to become a part of our local church ministries. Because we believe it is always morning in the Church of the Nazarene. We should not run from the challenges of culture, but remain engaged and become the healing balm of Jesus' holy love. In his day, Brzee encouraged the church to provide city missions, evangelistic services, house-to-house visitation, care for the poor, and comfort for the dying. There will always be opportunities to shine the transformational light of Jesus Christ into the critical issues of this day. To this end, Brzee said, we strive personally to walk with God and to incite others so to do. My dear Nazarene friends, my brothers and sisters, if we believe that the light of Jesus is continually breaking into our world, then we will move forward in faith. Jesus, preaching his Sermon on the Mount, reminded his disciples that they were now to be the bearers of his light. Because we recognize the encroaching darkness of our world, we will continue to press on, taking his light into the places the church has not yet reached. Folks, our cities around the world are growing. 
and they're taking on a multicultural reality that needs the light of Christ. We must intentionally plant churches and ministries in the cities that reflect the multicultural flavor of those communities. Good morning. Our founding mothers and fathers were also of sound doctrine. They were able to articulate faith and theology well. And whether formally educated or self-taught, they took the time to know what it was that they believed. Many of the early Nazarene laity had libraries that were filled with holiness literature, including the church's periodicals, which means the Holiness Today magazine. Those who choose to participate or those who chose to participate in the theological debates of the early church. They spent a lot of time, much time, in personal study and spiritual formation. These were not simply intellectual or academic theologians, but they were individuals who endeavored to provide a Christ-centered explanation for what they and the Christian community had experienced. This exercise of articulation became a form of apologetics and a way of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Today, we have an ever-increasing need for an educated and spirit-filled clergy, for women and men at all levels of leadership with a passion for leading the world to Christ. The church needs to provide a pathway for women and men, young and old, from every nation and ethnicity to find their voices in preaching the gospel and a place at the table of decision-making and leadership. Good morning. In some ways, we find ourselves in uncharted territory, and yet, We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, the faithful who've gone before us, and they have left us a roadmap from the past that will lead us into the future. The light is dawning today. It's a new day for the Church of the Nazarene. Arising from this pandemic, we have an opportunity to reflect the Lordship of Jesus Christ by making Christ-like disciples in the nations. And if we focus on bringing people to Christ, to a place of radical conversion, on vibrant discipleship, into a new lifestyle, on holiness, and the training up of new spirit-filled leaders, then it will be morning in the Church of the Nazarene. Good morning! Nathaniel famously asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said, come and see. Our world may be asking, can anything good come from the Nazarenes? And I would suggest, come and see. Good morning. It's always morning in the Church of the Nazarene. The King is in the room, and Jesus is Lord. There's never been a love so great. He died so we could live. Then he rose up from that grave. Name another king like this. Now all the authority forever belongs to him he reigns in victory name another king like this there's never been a love so great he died so we could live then he rose up from that
He's awesome in power. His holy name. Amen. Well, we're so thankful for that wonderful report. Amen? Amen. Could we express our appreciation to Dr. Sunberg? <laughs> and not only do we thank her, but we commit ourselves to him. Amen. So could we just pray? Father, we come to you right now upon receiving this report from Dr. Sunberg and the Board of General Superintendents. Our hearts say a a great big amen. May it be so, Lord. May it be so in us as the Church of the Nazarene. May it be so in every one of our pastors and district superintendents and every one of our missionaries and every lay person and every young person. Lord, may it be so. May our hearts be set on fire. May we be committed to the message that you have entrusted to us. May we not be content just having it ourselves, but Lord, may you put us on fire to send us out into our world to tell others about you. So, Lord, I pray that today that the words that we have heard are not just a report, but, Lord, they would stir something deep in our own hearts that we will not get over, but it will change us and set us forth from this place. When we leave this general assembly, we'll remember that you want to continue to shine your grace and your love around the world through the Church of the Nazarene and your people. And for all of this, Lord, for all that we've heard and all we've received, we give you honor and glory and praise, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you be seated for just a moment? We have just some announcements for you before we go. First of all, we just want to say thank you to NDI and SDMI and NYI and for your conventions. Thank you, delegates, for being here. Let's express our appreciation to them. (laughs) We know that you've had some wonderful conventions, and we just appreciate you being here for the quadrennial address and for all that you are doing in the local church through the local ministries, and we're thankful for that. Well, we've come to the end of our first business session of this assembly, and we're going to recess for lunch in just a moment. But let me just encourage you to do something. That as you go to lunch, you will not leave the Indiana Convention Center to go and sit down at a restaurant where you will order, and it will take you two hours to get your food. Our general secretary has arranged for us to have a number of eating options right here in the Indiana Convention Center. There's in the back of the exhibit hall, there's all kinds of different food vendors. There's vending machines. 
And uh, let me remind our international delegates, you will need your purchase cards because it's a cashless purchases here in the convention center. And then we want to encourage you, not encourage you, we urge you to be back at 1.30 where we will start our afternoon session and you will want to be here. We'll be doing some voting. And so we encourage all of our delegates to be here. And then as you leave this morning, we have a little something for you. Dr. Sernberg kept saying one phrase. Good morning. Well, usually the sun is shining in the morning. It's like some of my grandchildren, they have very sensitive eyes to the sun. So every time they go out in the sun, they have a pair of sunglasses. <clears throat> And so we have a, a pair of sunglasses for you that on the side, it has the logo of the Church of the Nazarene and it has good morning. And so as you leave today, this morning, you'll be able to get a pair of sunglasses to remember the message that the sun never goes down on the Church of the Nazarene. It's always good morning. Amen. Well, let's stand together. And let's have a word of prayer, asking God to bless our time, fellowship, and food. Father, thank you for your presence with us today. Thank you for each person here. Thank you for how you've brought us together, how you've graced us with your presence each and every service. We've been in your presence. It's been a holy, glorious time. And now, Lord, as we adjourn from this first business session and go to have some food and fellowship. I pray that you would bless and anoint our time together and bring us back this afternoon at 1.30 for a great business session. And for all that you've done, Lord, and all you're going to do, we give you honor and glory and praise for we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, amen. God bless you. We'll see you at 1.30.